six sites. And like as I've demonstrated, certainly in Dublin, I don't know I can, about the other prices. I'd be here, interested in hearing TDs in, in other areas. What are the price of these houses? And how are they ever going to do anything to help anyone involved in the housing crisis? So there is a, a way that NAMA could house between 50 to 100,000 people right now. NAMA could wipe out the social housing list in this country if its brief was changed. Now, I'm not blaming you, three here, because it's the government that decides the brief. But in an answer to a parliamentary question, and on page one of the pages of your presentation, you confirmed this, that NAMA has a claim over 2,800 hectares of residential land in, in the country. Um, 1,100 hectares in Dublin and 620 in Cork, for example, two of the biggest problem areas for the housing crisis. Um, why don't, if you built social and affordable houses on those hectares of land, you could house, for example, let's say in Dublin, 1,100 hectares at, say, 50 um, per hectare. That would be 55,000 people housed. You know, I'm just saying the, the brief of NAMA is run along profit lines and along the lines of, you know, bailing out developers and getting loans repaid for the state. But if its brief was changed, it has enough land already zoned, and if it had emergency legislation, we could build houses quite quickly on them. Um, the other issue is um, the hoarding of land that NAMA has been involved in, and it isn't just me saying it, it's the Minister, Michael Noonan himself has said it in parliamentary questions. It wasn't until 2014 that NAMA started releasing land for housing. Meanwhile, the housing crisis was building up and NAMA had all this land. So it's about time there was an honest discussion about the role that the government, uh, previous and cur you know, the current, in setting up NAMA has played in allowing housing to um, become very scarce. For example, in a housing forum, forum last month, NAMA said it had sold enough land for 20,500 units since 2014. In the most sought after, and this is a quote, areas of the capital, the commuter counties of Wicklow, Kildare, Meath and Loud, and the cities of Cork, Limerick and Galway, at the height of the housing crisis and in the areas where the crisis is worse, you know, that you have sold enough land for those units. And by the way, only 1,100 units have been built on that land, indicating developers have been hoarding land, waiting for house prices and profits to rise. Um, so that's the key problem we have. Again, it's the private sector control of housing in this country and being facilitated by NAMA as, it, as it's currently set up. Um, and I would argue that you encourage developers to hoard land and you let a housing shortage develop. Um, and my, I, could, I don't have time to give all the quotes, but for example, a Freedom of Info Information request in the Irish Independent last month um, showed that Michael Noonan wrote to you saying you must bring land to market more quickly to stop developers hoarding sites. And he went on to, to say that, you know, NAMA was contributing to the problem. So I, why was that decision taken when even the minister himself had to intervene? Um, yeah, just on the social housing spend to date and projected in your NAMA wind-up, um, you brag about £260 million that you've contributed to social housing, but you had a turnover of £34 billion. That's the problem, you know, that, that it's such, so minuscule. Why has so little been spent on new social housing? Now, I know your primary aim is financial return. There seems to be no social element to NAMA whatsoever. Um, so is it you making that decision that there isn't much of a social element or is it the, the government ordering you? I think we need to know that. Um, and can I just say that if the remaining money that NAMA has, I think you have £3 billion in cash at the moment, or you had recently, you might clarify that. If that was even used now, at this very late stage, for affordable and social housing, that would make a huge inroad into the problem. Just the next question is your connection to vulture funds. You denied there today that you sold 90% of your stock to uh, vulture funds. But I, I'm not talking about housing. You, if you include land and all of the commercial, all of the 
loans, 90% did get sold to venture funds, as far as I can see. Now, one of those, you also say that your, you know, your existing tenancy arrangements tend not to be impacted, which you said. But to give you an example of one apartment block in Clontarf uh, that NAMA sold on to uh, Grant Thornton to a receiver, um, the, the receiver immediately went about imposing a 25% rent increase on the tenants last year. And um, obviously the tenants challenged this at the PRTB and, you know, have been doing so ever since. Do you not think NAMA should have some kind of conscience about who it's selling to and what kind of lease arrangements are going to be put in place? Um, does NAMA have any policy of maintaining affordable rents when it sells on apartment complexes or, or houses? Um, apparently part of the reason... Uh, for, oh, by the way, some of these apartments are empty now, still, because they're being held on to, it would seem. And apparently part of the reason is that the loans on the apartments were in the process of being sold to a vulture fund, Promontoria, Arrow, as part of NAMA's Project Arrow deal. This is the... Um, the units are in uh, Clontarf and they're, what's it called, Bay... Bay Apartments in Clontarf. Um, by the way, no letters, nobody living in those apartments was informed by NAMA that they'd been sold on and they now had a new landlord and the first that residents heard about it was on the 28th of April when they got a letter just basically telling them and asking them to say what a lease arrangements they had, etc. So it's just that NAMA should be, one would have thought, not contributing to the rent increases that are going on. Um, but by, by selling to vulture funds, that, that is inevitable. Um, and by the way, most of these vulture funds pay no tax whatsoever in this country at all. Um, apparently, the, one of them paid €250 Euros in tax in 2014, despite holding over half a billion euros in assets. Um, that's the Beltony property finance. It's related to Goldman Sachs. So just the last question then will be right down to developers because this will impact on what money is available then to use for social and affordable housing. So the anti-austerity lines put in a parliamentary question on April 14th and as of the 31st of March, 442 of NAMA's original 779 debtor connections had exited NAMA. Um, these 442 had paid 18.5 billion, or owed 18.5 billion, but they only paid half of it, 9.6 billion. Only 44 debtors paid their debts in full to NAMA, which means that almost 400 debtors have effectively had an 8.9 billion write off in debts from NAMA between them, an average write off of 24 million per, per developer. Do you think that's acceptable? when people are struggling with mortgages that many of these developers, you know, profited handsomely from, that they should be let off, you know, so easily. Um, it seems only one in 20 NAMA developers pay their debts in full. So uh, it would seem that NAMA's been operated in a, in a way, to, like, you're, it's great to hear you're going to meet your targets ahead of time, but do you not think there's been undue haste to get rid of Assets and land, and with no care as to who it's going to. Deputy, we look forward, uh, the, Mr. Daly, and Mr. McDonough, an opportunity. There was a range of questions there, so in whatever order. Um, I suppose the, the general point, Deputy, is it's back to really a, a question about what what do we interpret as our mandate under the Act and the responsibilities we have, and what we can do under the Act. And I've already spoken about that. Uh, in relation to Deputy O'Brien's questions. So, you know, short of repeating myself, we have to act by, it, on, in accordance with the mandate and the responsibilities in the NAMA Act. We can't go outside that. Uh, and that is a mandate to get the best financial return we can for the Irish taxpayer and to do it as expeditiously as possible. That's in the Act as well. So that is what... Uh, that is a primary driver for us, and I know you probably won't agree with me, but our view is that the repayment of the debt is a priority for all sorts of other reasons. 
uh, and that it's only when we're sure we can do that that we can invest money in other things like social housing, like ghost estates, like the funding of 20,000 units. So whether you think it's adequate or not uh, is not the point, I think. The point is that for NAMA, we can't do any of that until we're sure we're generating the cash to repay our debt and have enough cash to fund that. And the housing uh, programme that we're going to fund, by the way, is going to cost about five billion. The Docklands development that we're going to fund is going to cost about two billion. We'll do all of that, uh, we'll repay the debt, and we will return a surplus to the state. Now, to your central point, we, we can't really do that unless we operate commercially and unless we deal with the investors who are prepared to buy uh, our assets. And you label them vulture funds, other people will call them investment companies. There will be others, there's private individuals, there's Irish investors. We put everything on the market and we take the best price we can, generally speaking. Uh, and unless we do that, we're not acting commercially. We're departing from our brief. We're open to challenge by our debtors and by receivers. And we will not get the wherewithal to do what we propose to do uh, in housing, in the Docklands, in anything else. So, I mean, I suppose that's the, that's the basic point, general point I would make, make and that is the NAMA Act. That's the responsibility that's being put on us. Uh, you, I know you have a different view, but I think that different view is a policy view, which really is beyond uh, our remit uh, here today. Um, I think there's a lot of questions in there about uh, individual sites and, uh, and that. But, and I'll leave those to Brendan. But you talked about hoarding, that NAM has been hoarding land we have 2,800 hectares, you're quite right, uh, of land at the moment, of development land, residential development land. But 1,500 of those, and I'm repeating myself at this stage, but 1,500 of those are earmarked to deliver the 20,000 houses on. Right? So that leaves about 1,300 uh, hectares. But not all of that, as I said earlier, is going to be, will ever be built on, because it's not suitable. It's not zoned, it's not in the right area, and a lot of it would not be uh, developed on. So we're not, we're not hoarding it, we're continually looking through it. And if there is a local authority that's interested in some of that land for residential development or whatever, we're quite happy to talk to them about it. But I think they know what we have, and I'm not sure that in a lot of that uh, 1,300 acres, which we don't think is viable at the moment, maybe it'll become viable in the future, I don't know, uh, I'm not sure there is the, the potential there that you, uh, that you say. Um, you ask about you know, how much cash we have on hands, uh, and it varies from time to time. But whatever cash we have on hands is the cash that is earmarked to repay the debt, and we have to repay more this year, is earmarked for the, the housing development, and it is earmarked for the docklands and other things we do, and to pay our own way, because we don't, as Brendan said earlier, borrow uh, along the way. Um, I'm not sure about the apartment blocks in Clontarf and that, or whether that's maybe so specific that I'm not sure we can answer you today, but maybe you have some information, Brian. Yeah, okay, Chairman. Deputy. Um, I mean, clearly our debtors have land across their portfolio, which some of us in very good uh, locations where uh, house prices are higher than than the norm, but that's the market. And uh, but uh, uh, the majority of our, our schemes are, uh, and we've said this before, are, are in this three hundred thousand uh, uh, bracket. You will have exceptions to that, as you would have anywhere. In terms of the fourteen thousand, I mean, we, what we said is that when we inherited the portfolio, this was built stock. Uh, sometimes, it uh, 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 and uh, we worked uh, straight away once we acquired a portfolio. We wanted to get money on this portfolio. If they couldn't be sold to the market, we said to our debtors and receivers, get people into it. Uh, you know, rent it. They rent. They rent it as much as they can. And the residual amount of six and a half thousand was offered up uh, to 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 the lo to the local authorities when the local authorities and the housing agency approached us, and they approached us about this about a year after we came into operation. So obviously, in the first year of operation, we were operating and renting into the private market. So that's actually you know what happened there, deputy. So we offered up what was available at that at, at that point in time. 
you talked about uh, there about the land and it could deliver you know 1100 hectares or whatever 50 uh, units per hectare 50 uh, you know uh, all, all, uh, 55,000 units but the reality is I said earlier on not all this that land is uh, is, is is zoned uh, properly uh, it requires uh, local area plans or requires infrastructure but if those things were in place then certainly the land could become available uh, for housing and the reality is that some of this housing uh, with all that which will take time to put in place and with everybody working full steam some of that uh, land might be available uh, for housing get to the planning system to 2019-2020 no matter how fast uh, everybody 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 works uh, on that. Uh, in terms of uh, land that we sold uh, we've sold over 20,000 uh, land with over 20,000 could deliver 20,000 units since the start of 2014. Between 2010 and uh, and uh, the end of 13, we sold land that could deliver 3,000 uh, uh, units. And the reality is that in that period, deputy, there wasn't a huge demand for either houses or land in the Irish market. There was huge demand. Well, there was, well, people I mean, were well, paying massive rents. There yeah, was but, but, demand. But, but, but people didn't have the they money. They just to couldn't buy. afford to buy them. They couldn't afford to buy them. But yeah. I mean, we, what we were trying to do is sell down the portfolio. That's what we were obliged to do to pay off the, to pay off the debt. But there wasn't huge demand in terms of buyers who had money to buy the land. I wanted to, to invest that because obviously Ireland was in the Trika program at the time, and there wasn't a huge confidence uh, confidence there. Uh, you uh, you talked in uh, about uh, as the chairman says about a cash 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 balances it changed from time to time as of today it's about 2.4 billion euros in cash but we, uh, but we have another we, we have another two billion of bond redemption to, to do this year so and we need money to fund the various developments that we are involved in uh, you talked in about a specific scheme uh, in Clontarf, I don't have the detail about that, uh, Deputy. Uh, we'll uh, look about that. And you talked about, uh, I mean, it's not up to NAMA to write to the tenants to, because we're a secured lender, Bank of Ireland, or AIB, or Ulster Bank, would not write to the tenants. It's the owner of the property who writes to the, t writes to the tenants. And, would, and, and that stays, if there, if there was a receiver in place, he'd be in the shoes of the owner. He's the person who would actually have to, de have to de deal with the tenants. And, um, you know, uh, whether it's a NAMA scheme or not, I don't have the detail with me. Uh, and, but uh, once the buyer uh, uh, buys the portfolio, what he's going to do with it, he's going to, he, he, uh, he is, he is, he's going to, he is going to do, do, do with it. You talk about your parliamentary question. We answered that parliament, parliamentary question. Uh, uh, not all the debt has been written, ha, has been written off. Uh, I think the answer to the parliamentary question said about 1.6 billion of power debt has been written off. Um, uh, the reality is that uh, where a debtor has borrowed money and he has sold all the assets and he has given us up any other assets that he can to the maximum potential, uh, 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 then that's what will be realised. I mean, the problem here in the first instance is that the debtors came into NAMA had borrowed 74 billion euros from the banks and when we bought the assets from the banks, they were only worth 26 billion euros. We ended up paying the banks 31 billion euros, 5.6 5 billion, 5 .6 billion more than what they were worth at the time, because that was what the government wanted. That was the state aid, and we've had to work in to claw back that overpayment of 5.6 billion we paid them on day one, and now so now generate a surplus. So, I mean, that's what the reality is. If the properties were worth, we'd love to be in the position to come back today and say we bought the 74 billion portfolio uh, for 32 billion. And we're now, uh, we've been able to sell that portfolio for, for, for 74 billion, but that's not the reality. The reality is that the, the, the lending was bad lending in the first place, and there was and, and there was overinflated property values, and that's something that we inherited, not something that that we that we uh, created. Um, I think between myself and the chairman, I think we've answered your questions. Mr. Whelan, so did you want to comment? Well, just one further yeah. point. Uh, you talked about whether we, or you asked whether we had been sitting on land. The reality is, and you're, you're very aware of the development model and the development financing model that had uh, built up in the boom, the loans that we inherited were secured on sites that had no planning, that had planning that simply could not be delivered, uh, were in areas which required new local area plans, new county development plans, new STZs. And what NAMA did in 2010, 2011, 2012 was to work with debtors and work with local authorities to try and get planning, 
uh, and we have a, a land strategy in place for every single hectare of land within the portfolio. The units that we are now delivering are the byproduct of that planning work that was done. We don't work as was previously the case under the model. We work on a cluster basis with local authorities. We go in with local authorities. We identify contiguous land, neighbouring land. We look at what needs to happen first, this site or that site. So I don't. I, I, I understand your, your point. But to be fair, there was a large proportion of development land uh, inherited that required a huge amount of intensive asset management and planning work to get it where it is today. Yeah, and the reality is that we, at the very start, when we acquired a portfolio, uh, our debtors uh, controlled less than, thir thir less than 30 per cent of the development land in Dublin. That meant then that other people had 70 per cent who were not in AMA had 70 per cent of the development land in Dublin. And we watch what's going on with land and, and things of like this. And a lot of that land, not, mu not much is happening on it. You know, so you know we're not the only player in the market here. We accept uh, our debtors are big, uh, reasonable players when they're all close together. But there's other major players in the market who, are, who, are, who, are, who, are, who have a lot of land. Thank, th thank you. Just one sentence, Carol. Very Kerr. briefly, yeah. because I have others, and I'm, I'm conscious of the time. No, so you did have 30% of development land in Dublin, and but also you keep saying we only have a relationship with these debtors. <coughs> they're in default. You can foreclose and repossess at any time. So let's not make out, it's just a little but relationship. Thank you, but, but Deputy, there's an important aspect there, is that the receiver is legally obliged to maximise the return if he steps into the place, the shoes of the debtor. That's what he's legally obliged to do uh, under the uh, 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 legislation passed by the Oireachtas. And it's the same in, 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 the, in the UK as in Ireland. That's, so that you, you just can't cast people aside and say, actually, we're just going to take that off you and give it away for free. You just can't do that. Thank, thank you, Mr. McDonnell. I just say to the remaining, uh, we have a number of other people, so just keep an eye on the time. Deputy O'Sullivan, you're next, Okay, please. thank you very much. Um, I know you have various questions in relation to the units that local authorities turned down. I just have one specific one, and it is that everything that was turned down, have, that, have they all been disposed of at this stage? That's the first one. The second one comes to the Docklands. And I think it's 75 per cent of undeveloped land that you have control of in the Docklands area. Um, the bulk of the development is going to be for commercial purposes for office space. And the 2,000 apartments is what we get 10 per cent of that for Dublin City Council. Um, from what you were saying earlier, do I take it that if Dublin City Council came back and looked for more in that particular area, that you would be open to talking to them? But I do think an opportunity has been lost there in that particular area to do more, and I don't think you're fulfilling the social development aspect part of your brief um, by what's being offered for housing in that particular area. Now, regarding hotels, we know how totally unsuitable they are, particularly for families, but I do think because we have an emergency that there is scope there for them to be used for certain people. Have you got hotels that could be used in this particular way? Um, are you sitting on vacant hotels at the moment? Um, my last question is in relation to Project Jewel and the loans that you sold on. Now, I know there are a lot of concerns over the fact that part of what you sold on was an area of great historical and cultural significance, the battlefield site. But I also think there was an opportunity there for housing, and I'd like to know why that was not considered at all when Project Jewel, when those loans were being sold on. Thank you, Deputy O'Sullivan. Mr McDonough, some very direct questions. Okay. Um, you said in terms of units that, 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 that would be turned down. The reality is that when they were turned down, as I said, we have 6,000 units left, and some of them would be the ones the local authorities turned down, and they were taken up by the private sector. Okay. Yeah, yeah. It's just, uh, there's 99 per cent occupancy in it at present, and the other 1 per cent is just people moving in and out as they come to the end of their leases. You talked about the Dublin Docklands. The STZ was, was uh, proposed and adopted by Dublin City Council when the Minister of Environment went to a board canola. Uh, it is, you are right in terms of that NAMA debtors uh, had 75 per cent of, of that about 3.8 million square feet of commercial office space and 2,000 apartments. That's what the, uh, the policy decision was. That wasn't NAMA's decision around that. Uh, whatever the Part 5 obligation around that, 10 per cent, then 
ten percent of that will become uh, social house uh, social housing units, and that has to be complied with. Uh, the issue of whether Dublin City Council wants more units and that, uh, you know, that's always up for for discussion. But they would have to buy them or whatever at market value or whatever the case is. That's just just the reality. You talked about Nama hotels. Uh, we are at present there is only there is 31 hotels uh, left in Nama and they're all operating hotels at present. So there is no vac there, there 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 is no vacant hotel at present. You talked in about uh, Project Jewel that was a loan sale at Moore Street, as you would be aware, deputy. Uh, Department of um, Arts Heritage Gate took bought a certain site of that in Moore Street for uh, for uh, as part as as part of the um, uh, preparations uh, for a historic a historic a historic a historic monument. The planning uh, uh, there is for a new a rejuvenation of that area, a, a, a shopping a shopping centre. Uh, uh, I. I think as part of that planning there will be a certain amount of residential units in that, but that's for the new owners, uh, which is a, a, U, uh, a UK uh, major PLC in conjunction with the debtor uh, about what, what plannings they're, they're going to submit about that. So I hope that answers your questions. Thank you, Mr. McDonough. Deputy Wallace. Thank you, Peter Luck. Um, I, I, I'm... Um, I, Given the the, uh, the forum that we're in, I'm I'm not uh, I'm far more interested in what uh, you are going to do in the future than what you did in the past. And uh, uh, but just for some clarity, uh, just to I suppose uh, start at a couple of points in that area. Uh, Brendan, you, you were making the point that um, you paid 32 billion for assets that were worth approximately 5 billion less. Um, but my understanding was that when, and I don't disagree with you for a second, that they weren't worth any more than 25 billion at the time. Uh, but uh, my understanding was that when NAMO was set up, that the idea was not to flood the market with uh, assets at fire sale prices, where uh, it was actually going to be even worse than, than what we got. Uh, and the idea was that we would put them into deep freeze, hold them for a while, wait for some form of recovery in the market. So. Uh, while they were only worth 35, 25 billion, we we'll say at the time, and you were paying 32, I think it's uh, a bit disingenuous to say that. Well, there was always going to be some form of recovery. They were never going to always stay at 25 or 32, and there was going to be some form of recovery. But it, it, I, I'm interested in getting into an argument over what something was worth on the particular days, and we, we can argue with the cows come home about that. But uh, just on that, uh, I, uh, I understand that. The NAMA Act and the approach of the Minister of Finance is very strongly linked to how you have acted. Uh, but I suppose I, I probably do feel that there was probably so, there is some decisions being made. There is some room for movement, and uh, I'm just wondering, uh, you know, you, you, you seem to have been under a great time pressure. Uh, which meant that stuff was sold at a high discount. Uh, obviously, the decision to sell in large bundles uh, did obviously bring in the uh, vulture funds, investment funds, as you prefer to call them, and they have distorted the market uh, dramatically. Uh, I mean, and for one, a, a small example I've given a number of times, two bed apartments in Dominic Street uh, were 900 a month, and now they're 1,500 because of the fact that so, uh, small group of, of big players, uh, investment funds from abroad, have a, a big impact on the market now. Uh, uh, and I'm just wondering, just how much autonomy have you had in making those decisions? When to sell, what to sell, when, where, uh, how much of a, of a role has the, the Minister of Finance had in your decision making? Or were you just given saying, there's the Namite, there's the rules, away with you? Um, I, I, I notice, uh, I seen on, um, in a letter on the 28th of September 2015 that you wrote to the Minister 
And uh, just to read a small bit from it, at our meeting with you on the 15th of September, you requested that the NAMA board assess the increased contribution that NAMA could make to residential delivery if it were to be given a, a new mandate to maximise the delivery of housing in, in the period of 2020. So, and I accept that, I mean, it's only in September 15 that the Minister for Finance is talking to you about a new mandate. And, he's, and when you're right, you wrote back to him saying that during the meeting you stated your endorsement of the board's objective of redeeming all senior debt by 2018 and the repayment of subordinate debt in March 20, and you indicated that in your view, achievement of these senior and sub-debt repayment targets should take precedence over the provision of funding that would be required for NAMA residential projects in any revised strategy. So, I mean, I might understand that really uh, you are being dictated strongly to by the Minister for Finance, or am I misreading that? Um, my second question, uh, I suppose, around the, the 20,000 units. Uh, obviously, you've kind of brought a new dimension into it by you know, linking um, the, um, the role of the debtor in this and uh, um, you're, you're more or less saying that he obviously he can't be treated any different than anyone else, but uh, I would have thought as well that... Um, you probably might have had more flexibility on it, or maybe I'm wrong. Um, but all this land, which is, you're saying uh, is sitting on approximately 1,500 hectares, if the rule of state aid, if Brussels isn't going to allow ye to deliver something in the region of more like a minimum of 30% social uh, from that potential, uh, is there a mechanism where that land in any way could go back to the state? So the, and is there any way that, I mean, so the state could actually carry out that project? Uh, and uh, I mean, is there, I'm just wondering, is, is there no way around uh, the state aid challenge in order to address the problem? Because the, the truth be told, even though social has probably never uh, gone higher than 15% in the state. Realistically, in the future, we're probably looking at it in, uh, in the region. Uh, the amount of pe people in Ireland uh, looking for housing in the next 20 years, about 30% of them are probably going to be dependent on the state to supply it directly. And so uh, giving 10% of these units to them, to supplying 10 of social out of all this potential, uh, is way below the demand. Uh, just added to that, uh, I, I suppose... The, the price of 300,000, I mean, I'm sure you well realise that the, the, the people with having the most difficulty gaining access to housing in Ireland at the moment have no hope on earth of coming up with that kind of money, OK? Uh, with, in that price, um, I just asked you, are you factoring in the land cost that you're sitting on in that price? And Sorry, has somebody phoned on? Uh, are you fighting in a profit margin for NAMA in that price? Okay. Uh, there's uh, the Dublin Docklands. Uh, I, I know that uh, Maureen raised, uh, raised this issue as well. Um, obviously, SDZs uh, obviously very convenient for you to work with. Uh, uh, the fact that it is so predominantly commercially orientated, and I can understand the logic behind it, uh, it, it actually suits commercial property down there, but given the, the, the dire need for residential in that area as well, who actually made, and I, I, I presume, I, I, my, I would actually be fairly convinced that it wasn't ye, that, uh, that the planners in Dublin City Council must have made the call that this, this Dublin Docklands SEZ area was going to be predominantly dominated by commercial, and had you any say in that matter? Um, on the uh, just, uh, Brendan, you mentioned the cost of labour in construction, and that it hasn't changed a whole lot uh, over the years. Well, just for the record, I'd like to make the point that I, I mean. Uh, I employed a few hundred people, and most of them are still involved in construction in Ireland. Uh, and I can tell you that the general worker is taking home a lot less than he was. And I would say of the subcontractor, they are working for crazy rates still. And there's a big problem there. Uh, the, the guy who's doing the work on the site is making uh, a lot less than he was. 
and anyone who tells you otherwise is being economical with the truth. Uh, just on the uh, Sorry, um, sorry. Yeah, one more question. Just, um, uh, Chairman, uh, when, when you made the point that the biggest social dividend is to pay back the debt as soon as possible, and you went, you said later that repayment of the debt is priority. Um, is this not a a political statement as well? And I mean, and you did start off saying that you weren't going to go into the political area, um, but surely how we spend our money, uh, when, how, how soon we pay down debt. This, we're talking about a debt, if I'm right, in the region of about 1%. And, and I know that there's people in Europe that would like us to pay it down uh, as early as possible. But at the same time, there is some flexibility. I see all the countries across Europe availing of certain flexibilities with strong bodies in Europe. And I'm just wondering, given that paying down money that's costing 1% seems a little bit, uh, to be in a panic to do so, to be in a rush to do so, uh, seems a bit irrational given the huge pressures created by the emergency around housing. And uh, I'm just wondering, uh, well, first of all, do you agree that there is a political dimension to that statement? And uh, uh, surely, there is options here of some sort. I'm, I'm not saying there's mad flexibility, but uh, surely there must be some options in that area. Thank you, Deputy Wallace. Chairman, I might take, I think it's the second question and the last one, and maybe link them, to, link them together, uh, if, if, if that's okay. Because uh, you talked about are we under time pressure, how much autonomy do we have, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we're an independent board. Uh, we operate, our mandate is the Act. We do engage with the Minister from time to time, and it would be wrong of us not to. And uh, generally, uh, he, we would have uh, a review of our strategy every year, and uh, sometimes he would come along to that and uh, engage with us. But at the end of the day, the strategy for NAMA uh, is by and large that of the Board. And uh, you can talk about that right from the beginning, uh, the strategy to uh, not dump assets on the Irish market up to, you know, in 2010, 11, 12, which would have only done more damage uh, to a fragile market. Uh, then that market recovering in 2013 and now getting more active in the Irish market. Uh, in the earlier years then being very active in the UK market, which actually has been quite good to us in terms of uh, realising uh, our assets there, and all of that feeding into our capacity to repay debt and to invest in housing or, or docklands. So, but all of that, that's the strategic policy of NAMA, set by the NAMA board. I certainly won't deny that we would engage with the Minister from time to time, but he has not directed us in any particular area there. He has left it to us and, you know, at, at the end of the day we can all argue about uh, whether along the way it was the broadly right strategic approach or not, but we're convinced it was. Part of that is uh, a focus we have, uh, you're quite right, on uh, the debt, paying down the debt. Now, I'm not talking about the wider issue of debt repayment in the state, uh, which certainly would be getting me into the political uh, area. I, and I'm not making a political statement when I say that NAMA's priority is to repay its debt, because I believe, and my board colleagues believe, that that contingent liability is a drag on the state, and that until NAMA has it paid off, uh, it's going to remain there, and it could impact on Ireland standing in the financial markets or whatever. So that, that's our belief, you know, that's our strategy. Uh, we're well advanced on that. We're probably two years ahead of uh, target on that. And we will have that senior debt. And it's the senior debt that is the contingent liability. We'll have that senior debt repaid by uh, 2018. Um, but all of it is a strategy devised by the NAMA board, continually reviewed by the NAMA board, uh, and based on you know, whatever expert input we can get from the executive or from uh, uh, external experts, 
Uh, it's our strategy. Uh, I'm not making a political statement when I say that we regard debt repayment as a priority. I'm saying that is the NAMA strategy and that is the view of the Board of NAMA. And the Minister has not uh, put us under, under great time pressure or anything uh, like that. Um, Again, it's back to your final point, the biggest social dividend, I still believe it is to actually repay the debt. Uh, and along the way, we are generating enough cash, thankfully, to invest in housing and to invest in, in the Docklands. Uh, I think there's another issue that you raised about state aid and social housing. Uh, state aid is not really the barrier uh, in terms of social housing. The state aid issue arises in relation to NAMA's plans to build the 20,000 uh, private houses for the market. That's where the state aid concern is with Brussels. And it's more there than in whether we uh, offer, as we have offered, 6,000 houses for social uh, use. That's, that's not, I think, an issue that concerns uh, um, Brussels too much. I think on the Docklands SDZ, uh, and you talked about the, the decision uh, that there would be just 2,000 residential units. It's the same point, I think, made by Deputy O'Sullivan. And who made that decision? It was made in the context of the designation of the SDZ. And there was wide consultation around that. Uh, any interested parties had the uh, possibility to input to that process. And we did as well. But I mean, I think you're... You acknowledge that really the anchor program in the Docklands is probably prime commercial office space, which is uh, in badly needed in that central business district in Dublin. Maybe there are some other yeah. points. That There's some other questions you raised there, Deputy Wallace. Um, you talked about that there's going to be an increased reliance on on uh, the state providing housing in the future, things like this, and I don't disagree with you on that. I, th I think the business model, uh, the model of changing where people try to acquire their homes, uh, the, there might be changes more people towards moving towards renting and things like that. And obviously, as the cost of housing goes up, then it's more hard, difficult for people to get mortgages or being, or being able to afford. And I mean, you are correct uh, for a three hundred thousand pound thousand euro house at present. Under the central bank rules, you need a 38,000 euro deposit, which is a, a big deposit for people. And we're certainly seeing people, uh, our debtors are telling us that in the schemes that they they launched, that people are coming are coming back and saying, "I really want this house, but I I'm 10,000 euros short." And they come back the following week and say, "Actually, well, you know, my my." brother or my sister my father will lend me 5,000 and 5,000 euros short and, and things like this because they really want to buy the house but they're just really caught by the central bank rules and and I, I think I know it's been reviewed by the central bank in, uh, later this year but I think like everything it might be good in principle but as I keep saying this that there, there might be uh, if anything at all calibration is an important point there in terms of 220,000 is a very low threshold very low level for a 10% deposit in my view but that's a matter for the central bank you talked about the Docklands chairman there about the 2,000 units. Yes, that was a decision ultimately by started off uh, uh, the chief executive of the city council, and then the, the council adapted that at, at, and uh, issues around that. So, um, uh, you talked about the value the, the value of assets back when they were, and you know the value of assets is what they were at the point of time, and of course the reality, as I said, deputy. We might have paid, should have only paid 26 billion for them. We ended up paying 32 to the banks for them, and then the market dropped 30 percent again from that. So they probably only worth 22 billion uh, at uh, at one stage. So there's been, I suppose, a big turnaround in in, in terms of that. And uh, I don't just, I mean, you made the issue there uh, there about, about about the the, the cost the, the cost the cost of labour, and I don't disagree with you. But I, I'm just saying, making the point is that. I talk to a lot of people uh, as well, and and uh, they're saying that it, the, you know the cost of, cost of labour where registered employment contracts is, is is still a big issue. So people can have different views, except that. And uh, but I suppose all I'm saying is what I what I'm hearing, and 
I will go back and interrogate it again, I assure you, but uh, that's, I hope to answer your questions. And you wanted to? Just to add just on, the, on the SDZ deputy, the SDZ, which was adopted as, as Chairman CEO said by the elected members of Dublin City Council, it actually provides for a 50 50 split between in terms of land use, but as you know, in terms of what you can build given the height issues and so on for residential versus uh, uh, commercial. So that is actually the land split. It's across, it's split into blocks, and across the blocks, the average split in terms of plot area, in terms of site area, has to be 50 50. Um, and, and that is, as you said, that's an adopted plan. And we worked that we would have simply have met a submission the same as the same as uh, any other party. Well, if it's yeah. going to be brief. Yeah, just one follow up question. Uh, Chairman, uh, uh, just to bite to the point that you're making about it, you say you insist you're sticking to your point that the biggest social dividend is to pay back the debt as soon as possible. Would you agree that uh, that that is what would be regarded as a neoliberal position, and would you agree that people who would actually think that uh, the best interests of the people should be served before those of business might have a different view? Thank you. Deputy Wallace, that's the. I don't know if the I don't know if the chairman wants to comment on policy. I prefer not to get into a debate I, on neoliberalism. I thought that might be the case, Mr. I, Daly. I stand with this, but I, I suppose you're related to the people. The debt is on the people. So my point is, we pay that debt because the debt is on the Irish people. So let's get rid of it. So I'm, that's not neoliberalism. That's Irish people's debt. It was the developers' debt, not the Irish people's debt. Well, no, well, well, whether it was, it may have started off as it has ended up as a debt around the necks of the Irish people. Because certain people that's chose happened. to do that. Yeah. Deputy Capture, Mr. Daly, I have your answer on it, and, and members may have different views. We're running late at this stage of the day, but there are two other people who want to contribute. We're resuming at two o'clock for the next session, so I'll take the two contributors together if that's okay. Deputy Butler and then Deputy Byrne. Um, thank you, Cahirda. Um, I also like. Um Deputy Wallace think that we have to look forward and that I think the whole purpose of this committee, um, Housing and Homelessness Committee, like we know we're in crisis mode and I think the whole objective of this committee is to try and look at solutions and see how we can move on from there. Now um, my first point question really is in relation to the delivery of 20,000 residential units by end of 2020 subject to commercial viability. My whole problem there is that 93% of the, of the um, residential units will be delivered in the Greater Dublin area, and only 7% will be located outside the Greater Dublin area. So we're talking about of the 20,000 um, subject to commercial viability houses, that 1,400 or 1,400 will be delivered outside of the Greater Dublin area, with 18,600 delivered within the Dublin area. Now, the fact that you take the likes of Waterford with 3,000 on a housing list, Cork with 7,000 on a housing list, um, I, I, I certainly feel that. Um, this is not correct. I know the, the, the majority of the problem is in Dublin and the greater Dublin area, but I, I do think Cork is, is second, and then we have the other cities like Kilkenny, Limerick and Galway, and I, I would definitely like this to, to be looked at. Um, another point I'd like to raise, going back to the cost of building a house, which we seem to be spending a lot of time, of, time on, which, and which is very important that we do. Now, um, in your breakdown there, um, the VAT on a house, not including the land, uh, is, is 30,500. 30, and do you think, um, and I hope you'll be able to answer this within your remit, is there merit in reducing the VAT rate from 13.5% to 9 or even lower to reduce the cost of the home, especially in the case of first-time buyers trying to get on the property ladder? I've had other questions, but they've been asked, so just to keep it as brief as possible. Thank, thank you. Thank you, Deputy. Deputy Byrne. Uh, uh, thanks, Chair, and thank you, uh, all of you, uh, uh, Mr Daly, Mr McDonough, and Mr... Uh, Whelan for your presentation, which I found very informative, and I have to say this um, this presentation is, is excellent. Um, I, I suppose two of the questions I was going to ask, one was an, asked by um, Deputy O'Sullivan and somebody else to do the one. I just got two questions just to agree with you that there's no easy answer to this uh, housing crisis we have to build, and uh, there's no, it's a very complex issue, and the sooner the better we come to terms how complex it is, the better it is. Uh, just on the, on the hectare of lands, particularly in Dublin, uh, is, is, it's 1,173 hectares. Is the Bottle Glass Company part of that? And the other one is, is there any way of getting a list, or a, a, a list of what the other uh, sites are, if that's possible? I don't know whether that's back. We can give it to you by 
general location. So okay. say we can so that's so okay. you, you know that's yeah, fine. It won't be that a detail, but that's fine. But you, you, you get a fair idea of the areas like Rush, yeah, uh, last spot. But most whatever. of us would know our own kind of yeah. area, yeah. and we yeah. would know what yeah. land is. Yeah. But we've got, we are covered by statutory legislation passed by the Sirachtus Deputy, where mm -hmm. effectively there's, 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 there's an issue of confidentiality. That's passed by the Sirachtus. We, we have to uh, abide by the laws yeah. of the land. So I'm just I, saying I, how I, ironic in the middle of a housing crisis we but, can't but, but, even but, find But out. I'm saying for Deputy Byrne's question, yeah, we'll be able we'll, we'll, we'll yeah. to give the, the, general, the, the areas, so we'll be able yeah. to say, so we'll, we'll give you yeah, that that's information. Grand. Well, we can't yeah. identify the letter, but yeah. we, can, we can be creative indeed. No, just, just that deputy. Okay. It's relevant to the question. I thought the land registry actually has on its map a designation for land that has a relationship with NAMA, that you if, can differentiate it from other land. Well, there is a charge, uh, you know, the, yeah. and, 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 and uh, that's, I was only asking, and, and, so and that's even clear, but I suppose clarified a bit more. Babe, to look at that. We will get, we'll give it to you in as much detail. And just on the cost of building a house, because it's been a question that's come up all the time, and thank you for uh, your outline here. But is, is, is there a cost around apartments? Is it different when you're building apartments? And if there is, is there any chance on that? And just on the last thing, and I know it's not kind of, but we went yesterday to see modular housing out in. Ballymun, and uh, we, we were very impressed, I have to say, and I was as well. But on the modular housing and on the amount of sites, and I see Cherry Orchard is one of the sites, and I know it's in my constituency. The biggest problem we heard yesterday about the building of modular housing wasn't about the actual housing. It was about the clients or the tenants going into them, the residents had. It wasn't really about the housing, it was about who was going into them. I think, I think in general, um, uh, the local authorities need to tackle that end of things as well because they haven't been in the past able to deal with their antisocial behaviours with their own tenants, not, never mind private ones. But and I think that's been a real downfall on the side of the council because if they dealt with that, then people would be more acceptable to having uh, people move back into areas, which I think is shameful that we... I came from social housing, and all my family did as well. And why we go into social housing back in in the areas where our children want to live is it's very surprising to me. I know it's just an off-the-cuff comment, but I just want to make it because I think it's very important, and I really do believe that social mix is very important in every site. So if there's going to be a development of 200 units in Cherry Orchard, I would hope that would have a widespread social housing. Ten percent social housing. Okay, thank you, thank you. Just just before you before you answer, I just want to try, put in one minor point. You're, in responding to the correspondence that you you will send for Deputy Byrne, you mentioned when we when we talked about the uh, constrained units because of the deficit in infrastructure, you might send us a note on that because you indicated there were 13 or 14 thousand potential units. I suppose I don't want the individual locations, but a general breakdown of where they are, and if because one of the, the, the this committee is looking for recommendations, and what it's, you know if the infrastructure deficits are addressed, I suppose what we're looking at then is what would the time process be to actually deliver units in that context, and I don't expect you to have that with you, but if you could advise us, uh, and you might like to reply the, to the remaining Just to uh, Deputy Butler's, uh, uh, you're quite right, 93% of the houses are in the Greater Dublin area. Uh, there's not a huge percentage in Waterford, for example. Uh, much to my regret being from there, but however. Uh, but, you know, it's a question really of demand and viability, but we're, it's not that we have closed off places like Waterford or Wexford or anywhere like that. Uh, at any stage, if they become viable and there's demand, we will actually look at it. And of course, I would remind you that we're making a, a very significant investment in Waterford City in the Michael Street, New Street area, which is uh, uh, on that. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we were asked to give views to the minister quite some time ago on... Uh, issues around housing and how to deal with it and we did suggest that one of the options might be a temporary reduction in the rate of that on house building but we we would certainly be strongly of the view that mechanisms should be built in there to make sure that that is passed on yeah. to the purchaser yeah. okay yeah. to yeah. the purchaser yeah. i think that's the most important well, point. sorry why did you recommend that as nama like you're not meant to be political well we were asked to give views on problems in the housing sector and what did we think as a body that's trying to build houses, what were the barriers, what were the issues? So it's back to the price, it's back to the price of housing. 
Uh, there's no issue, by the way, around that. Those recommendations were published, as I understand it. And in fact, it might go linking, Chairman, to your last point about you looking for recommendations. It might be no harm if we passed on the substance of those recommendations uh, to the committee. Social housing or be private housing will get the VAT reduction. It's all, all housing. It'll be all, so there'll be no guarantee it'll ever benefit people who need houses. Like well, I mean, there's an awful lot of people who need houses. Yeah. You know, okay. and one of the real constraints and difficulties around at the moment is, and we've had this discussion, is it the cost of a basic starter house for somebody? So if you, if if a temporary VAT reduction is something that can help in that. And provided you have the mechanism to make sure it goes to the, the benefit of the purchase. In, re in relation to the question I actually asked, yeah. it was for first-time buyers trying yeah. to get on the property yeah. ladder. That yeah. was the, the, that well, was you, the substance you, you of know, the question. You, you, can, you can tailor it or calibrate it whatever way you want. But the concept of looking at the, the VAT take where you have a crisis, I think, is well worth while. I, I, we yeah. were certainly you can pass a VAT reduction onto a first time buyer. Thank you very much. The builder that gets. Excuse me. Excuse yeah, me. Know, we but let, let but that is, that's part of the difficulty, you see, that once you get into this, of VAT reductions for what? For yeah. starter so homes, for social housing. That is, uh, and I know because I spent a long time in revenue dealing with it, you can't be too selective in relation to VAT. But I think the most important point is you can create a mechanism where it is passed back to the purchaser. I mean, the existing VAT repayment, where, where if you do some work on your own house uh, and eventually it gets back to you, is a model, I think, that could be, could be looked at. There were a couple of other questions. Which yeah, Mr. McDonough. Uh, Deputy, um, you, you, I, I think, uh, Deputy Butler, your questions have been dealt with uh, by the Chairman, and there's a common question in there in terms of about, about the, the cost of building with uh, uh, Deputy Byrne. Um, I mean, the cost of building is the, is the cost of building, as I said, the, the figures we published we, we think are, are, are not unreasonable. Uh, the, that is, those costs are about building a house. The cost of a building, building apartments is much more expensive. And uh, apartments really only work in uh, high density areas, uh, density areas, and that, that's something that certainly would be uncovered, uh, I, would, I, I would be supportive of. But there's lots of I mean, the revised regulations in terms of uh, in terms of apartments have certainly been helpful, and it's not necessarily about this, the minimum size of apartments because these planning applications that we are seeing that's going in are actually all bigger than, than the minimum standards. Uh, but the issue really, uh, a real game changer there, has been about the, the, the number of cores which are there. So that actually allows you to 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 build a better engineered uh, scheme. But there is a huge amount of sunk costs in apartments which is not necessary, certainly in the city centre in my view, is that people who live in apartments generally don't uh, want car spaces. What they want is bicycle sheds and maybe a small gym or something because that is this. Because we, we've been involved in some schemes in some schemes in London and there isn't car spaces at all uh, effectively and it reduces the cost dramatically of the money that you're putting underground by actually not having to put that in. So that's something that I would, that I would, that I would, that I would hope to would, 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 would be looked at. So hope to answer your questions, Deputy. Thank you very much. At this stage of the afternoon, I'd like to thank Mr. Daly, Mr. McDonough, Mr. Whelan uh, for their attendance, their presentations and the replies to the questions, and also look forward to the written replies and that you've offered this committee. Thank you very much. Colleagues, we'll adjourn at this late stage to resume at 2 o'clock. Thank you very much.